my pleasure and honor to introduce you, uh, Professor Navdeep Chander from the Northern, Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, Nav is a full professor of medicine and biochemistry there. And he did uh, his uh, entire training at the University of Chicago with uh, Professor Simon L. Schumacher in the field of hypoxia, uh, mitochondria, and ROS. He published more than uh, uh, 230 publications in many high ranked journals such as Nature Science, PNS, Mars Cell, Cell Metabolism, and Immunity. His lab made important contribution to understand the role of the uh, mitochondria in physiology and pathology, such as aging, diabetes, and, and cancer. In the cancer field, they have strongly established that mitochondrial metabolism and ROS are necessary for tumor genesis in vivo, and they identified the target of forming the electron transfer change complex one, uh, uh, selective complex one inhibitor. So uh, today now uh, we'll present you their current findings on how mitochondrial signaling and metabolism are implicating cancer and immunity. Now the floor is yours and thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation uh, so early in, in, in the morning in your side. Uh, for, <laughs> the, for the audience, uh, please don't hesitate to ask your question. Uh, in person at the end of the presentation directly to a uh, nav or in the chat. Uh, if you want to ask the question in French, uh, I will do the translation, of course. Don't, don't hesitate. <laughs> Thank you so much, nav. So much. And uh, uh, it's very a pleasure to, to have you uh, uh, today in our institute uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. So the most important slide is uh, the acknowledgement slide. I'm going to tell you a little bit of the data from Inma Martinez Reyes, Heiwan Kong, and Greg McElroy. Uh, uh, Colleen Rezek, who's made some of our uh, some of our new mice. Uh, I have a nice collaboration with David Sabatini on CRISPR screens. Tim Wang, who pioneered those screens in his lab, and uh, we have a nice Drosophila collaboration with Joe Bateman at King's College. And I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end. That's something. Uh, by chance, we've gotten into neurobiology, which I didn't think I would ever get into. And so um, what my lab has been interested in for a long time is why mammalian cells respire. And uh, to be honest, we probably spent uh, until re recently, the last five years, probably the, from my undergraduate graduate days for almost 20 years, thinking about this question in the context of in vitro uh, models. And I would say, you know, much of the models at the cancer metabolism field initially built were on in vitro findings. And of course, this is obvious, but uh, uh, you know, especially to the audience today, uh, because uh, they've always done stuff in, in vivo. And uh, as I say, in vivo veritas, right? I mean, this is really the big challenge is to now to study all of this in the context of mm -hmm. in vivo in any organ, tumors, brain, heart, uh, which means you have to develop new tools and, um, uh, and, and new expertise. And so this has really been what we've been thinking about more and more. Why does any cell other than red blood cells respire in vivo? <clears throat> and if you remember from your biochemistry books, um, it's still oxidative phosphorylation is one explanation, right? So the act of respiration is where uh, cytochrome C oxidase, which I did my kinetics, uh, I did enzyme kinet kinetics on this uh, uh, complex as a graduate student, it still utilizes most of the molecular oxygen, and that's coupled to this protomotive force to generate ATP, right? And hence, mitochondria is a, a powerhouse of the cell. So that's one thing that respiration does. It links to ATP. The other thing I would argue is something that the biochemists in the 20th century uh, told us, and they wrote about it in their books, but uh, it's been a bit of a rediscovery by people like myself and others in the field, which is that the TCA cycle metabolites. So the TCA cycle is linked to respiration. And, uh, because NADH and FADH2 are regenerated to FAD and NAD by the respiratory chain. And one key feature of the TCA cycle is the generation of metabolites for macromolecule synthesis, right? So you just have to follow the carbons and oxaloacetate will go to aspartate to nucleotide, the citrate to fatty acids and, and sterols, or succinyl-CoA to heme, which sometimes people forget. <clears throat> so 
clearly I would argue that mitochondria have been established as bioenergetic and biosynthetic organelles. And the act of respiration is tied to these two functions, the generation of ATP and the generation of macromolecules. Well, so what's new? I would say that, at least for me, there's a lot of great experiments that have been in, in the last 25 years in the field of mitochondria, but probably the breakthrough experiment or the one that influenced me the most in the mid-90s was when Zhadong Wang discovered that cytochrome C can get released from mitochondria to invoke caspase-dependent cell death. Now think about it. Cytochrome C, just to go back, is here. It's part of electron transport, right? It is job is to transfer electrons, be participate in generating ATP. Uh, but if it, independent of that function of respiration, if it leaves a mitochondria, it can activate caspase 9 for cell death. And I think we were inspired by that and, and uh, quickly started to think about other signals. And one of the first ones we thought about is the release of H2O2 for gene expression. Uh, the other one we've gotten interested in TCA cycle metabolites was to determine cell fate or function. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in mitochondrial DNA releasing for inflammation. Even uh, if mitochondria are not generating enough ATP, you can obviously activate AMPK and switch from, uh, if, an, if a tumor or other systems are anabolic, it'll switch to a cat, uh, 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 to catabolism. And so just stepping back and asking you know, broadly, why does a mammalian cell respire? One could argue it's for bioenergetics, for ATP for survival. The other one is for biosynthesis, growth. Uh, and the third one is uh, signaling, right? The, the, all these mechanisms that I just talked about, which uh, control cell fate or function. And really, through the lens of those three functions and really the signaling aspects, we've been thinking about its role in cancer initially, immunity, um, we have ongoing work in aging, especially with respect to metformin, as uh, metformin is now being used in clinical trials as the first anti-aging drug, uh, and also neurological diseases. And uh, I'm going to focus a bit on cancer and a little bit on neurological disease, and I'll show you how we got into uh, thinking about the brain, really from some of our work in cancer. <clears throat> and so, with respect to cancer, I, I just want to highlight, um, we don't have anything new than other than what's been published, still have some ongoing stories. Um, but I want to just highlight uh, a difference between a cancer cell and let's say a proliferating stem cell, for example, right? And what we found is that clearly mitochondria support proliferation in cancer cells, and I'll show you a bit of this evidence. And the other thing is in stem cells, what we found is that, uh, you know, stem cells, they renew, right? They proliferate and renew themselves. And they make progenitors, right? They differentiate into progenitors. So they have two properties, self-renewal and making differentiating into progenitors. And to our surprise, uh, the major role we think of mitochondrial stem cells is not to control self-renewal, but to control the generation of progenitors or the certain progenitors to make uh, differentiated lineages. And let me show you an isogenic system that highlights this difference. Because I think one thing that many of us in the field thought is, well, with respect to any metabolic pathway, the act of proliferation should be the same, right? Uh, whether you're an organism like yeast that doubles or a stem cell or a cancer cell, right? You go from one cell to two daughter cells. And you can imagine that in vivo, they would all sort of have similar uh, metabolic vulnerabilities or certain metabolic uh, uh, properties that they share. The, so there, in other words, there's a common proliferative signal or, or pathway or metabolic pathway. And it turns out that's not the case, and here's the evidence. So one of the things we did like to do is take uh, mitochondrial complex three. We've got a bunch of uh, blocks from animals, so we can knock out mitochondrial complex three, uh, which is 11 subunits, 10 are nuclear encoded, so we can flux out any of the 10 genes and, and conditionally knock out complex three in any particular tissue, right, uh, and including in cancer models. Just to remind you, one of the major roles of complex three is to take electrons from ubiquinol. So the ubiquinol pool can take electrons from complex one, two, and DH or DH, which is a rate-limiting um, enzyme and permitting synthesis. And once uh, Q or ubiquinol gets those uh, two electrons, it becomes ubiquinol and passes it on to complex three. So what happens if you knock out conditionally complex three uh, by using the RISP uh, flux alleles? where RISP is one of the key subunits for complex three activity. And we use VAVCRED. So this is uh, 
knocking out in hematopoietic stem cells in vitro, right? And when we knock out uh, complex three in utero during development, hematopoietic stem cells, what you get is, as you can see, the wild types develop. Uh, you see this nice pink reddish hue coloring. And here they barely have uh, that coloring. And in fact, if you look at the cellularity, it's way down in the knockout. Uh, and we presume that basically these hematopoietic stem cells are not there, they're dying, they don't make progenitors, and this was going to be a very simple finding and not a big surprise. But the big surprise came is when we actually looked at the stem cell pools before they died, and the numbers were very similar, right, by all the normal markers. And so that was quite interesting that you had, you know, in the absence of complex three, you can make hematopoietic stem cells, right? You can, you can continue to generate them. And remember in utero, unlike the adult, in utero they really have to expand and quickly and then make progenitors and differentiate into the blood and, and uh, platelet lineages. While in the adult, uh, they're quiescent. Uh, uh, and, uh, but what we found uh, in utero is that if you looked at the multipotent progenitors, they were all down, right? So they had the ability to self-renew, oh, but they didn't have the ability to make progenitors, and they didn't make any of the downstream progenitors after the multipotent progenitor lineages. If you do the same experiment uh, and knock it out in the adult with the MX1 Cree, what you get is quiescent cells, those, uh, these adult quiescent hematopoietic stem cells, in the absence of complex three, they lose that quiescence, I'm not showing it as published, and they start to hyper-proliferate uh, and undergo stem cell exhaustion. I think the take home message is simply in the absence of complex three, stem cells will, uh, hematopoietic stem cells have the ability to proliferate in vivo. They just don't differentiate into different lineages. Okay, so now what happens if you take hematopoietic stem cells else, and you try to make them into leukemic cells by putting in a strong oncogene like the notch activating oncogene? This is a classic experiment. Many of you here do these sort of experiments on hematopoietic stem cells. So what we did here is we took a, a different allele of complex three, very similar to risk, uh, which is a QPC floxed mice. Uh, we crossed it to a ubiquitous uh, Cree with a ERT2. So uh, then we took those, uh, uh, either the floxed alleles or the wild type, we gave it notch. Uh, we put it in uh, bone marrow uh, irradiated recipients, four weeks of engraftment. You can start to get some... Uh, uh, it has a GFP marker to follow the leukemic cells. And then once we've established a little bit of leukemia, we, we then give it tamoxifen, which will excise uh, this remaining allele of QPC. And we just simply ask, do we get leukemia or not? And we don't, right? You can see the bone marrow, the GFP positive cells, which is indicative of the leukemia is very low. The spleen is low. Um, where the wild type uh, leukemic cells kill the animals here, uh, the knockouts continue to survive. And again, and what I like about this simple experiment is I showed you if it's a primary stem cell, it will still proliferate in the absence of complex three. It won't differentiate. Now, if we take that proliferating complex three knockout <clears throat> stem cell and we put a strong oncogene in uh, clearly uh, the, uh, now there's a, uh, it cannot, so mitochondria cannot support uh, in vivo proliferation of those leukemic cells. I'm not going to go through all the other fancy genetics and other models we've done uh, we, uh, as this was published last year, but the real take-home message here is that one major role of complex three is to allow uh, ubiquinone to continue to get electrons from DH or DH, complex one and two. Uh, by getting uh, electrons from complex one and two, you can do the TCA cycle round and round to make metabolites for growth. Um, uh, DH or DH also will continue to function for permitting synthesis. As, and I think uh, sort of the big take home message simply is that the mitochondria uh, in cancer cells at least is an anabolic machinery uh, where the TC electron transport chain in complex three supporting generation of succinyl CoA for heme synthesis, citrate for lipids, uh, oxaloacetate or orate for nucleotide synthesis. Uh, I will show uh, you know one um, thing that I'm very pleased is uh, my, my my friends and colleagues in the field, uh, Ralph Deberdinas and Josh Rabinovitz. And Josh Rabinovitz just had a really nice paper in the cell, the new cell press journal Med, uh, where they've been infusing 
uh, C13 labeled glucose or glutamine or lactate. And then they can see the TCA cycle being labeled by uh, in breast cancer and in, um, in glioma as well in lung cancer. And, and in Josh's recent paper, he actually followed those carbons from the TCA cycle and he could show that those the TCA cycle generates many amino acids. So in other words, showing that in vivo in breast cancer patients, and so the TCA cycle is generating metabolites uh, like for amino acids and, and you know that which would be needed for growth. Uh, so I think the model is uh, is, is likely to be correct. Um, and then uh, just to step back historically, as many of you know, uh, uh, Otto Warburg almost a hundred years ago started. Uh, the field by his observations that, uh, that uh, many tumor cells take up glycolysis, and that is completely true. Uh, but I think uh, sometimes it's been uh, misinterpreted to, and he himself sometimes misinterpreted his own data to suggest that the TCA cycle or mitochondria are not necessary. But our data and many other people's data, uh, uh, including uh, the, uh, the group here, my host, uh, has clearly shown very elegantly in many models that the mitochondria is essential. And for tumor genesis, and many people are thinking of targeting mitochondria in different settings for tumor genesis through a variety of new molecules. But a simplistic way to think about it is, you know, the, the glycolytic intermediates like glucose 6-phosphate is needed for nucleotide synthesis. TCA cycle can generate, for example, oxaloacetate for nucleotide synthesis. Or if you look at lipids, glycolytic intermediates can make uh, glycerol for lipids and uh, obviously citrate for fatty acids for lipids. And so we tend to think of them as, as both of them being equally important. They're just giving uh, a tumor cell different uh, ingredients for, for growth. And I think if you look at T cells where even or macrophages in cells that are not even growing, I would argue there the glycolytic intermediates are again providing things for function like macrophage function and so is the TCA cycle. So we always tend to think of both pathways are necessary for cell function, cell growth, uh, the key is figuring out what aspects of the TCA cycle or what aspects of glycolytic intermediates are important for cell function, signaling, or simply for growth. And that's something we continue to, um, to think about. But um, I know I'm belaboring this point, And again, I don't have to remind the people here who nicely uh, contributed to our understanding of mitochondria's essential role in tumor genesis. But I can tell you, this has been a long fight for uh, in the field for almost two decades that we've been slowly hammering. But I think this is the simple uh, uh, model that we uh, wrote with uh, Ralph Deberdeen is I think uh, this is likely a, a simplistic, but uh, uh, the correct way in my opinion to think about tumor metabolism. So I wanna show you uh, one uh, other tumor story real quick, uh, which is about ROS, something that I've been working on a long time. And again, um, <clears throat> Um, there's an old joke, you know, if you don't have a mechanism, just say it's ROS, right? Uh, ROS to do everything or perhaps nothing. But, but I think part of the reason that people sometimes uh, uh, say that about ROS is simply that, uh, you know, the, the targets of ROS, the specificity of ROS, uh, it wasn't clear. But more and more now, I think uh, we're getting a better handle on it. And one simplistic model, again, and is NADPH oxidases and mitochondria generate H2O2, uh, which then impinge on cysteine oxidation, and this has been linked to survival, proliferation, or, or metastasis of, of uh, tumors. There's, and then H2O2 um, can become hydroxyl radical, and with polyunsaturated fatty acid, it can make lipid radicals for ferroptosis. And ferroptosis will kill cells. It'll, it, it'll damage tissues, normal tissues. And in fact, many of the ROS tissue damage is now related to ferroptosis. But in cancer, of course, if you invoke ferroptosis, cancer cells die. And so what cancer cells tend to do is they tend to overcompensate uh, by putting a lot of uh, um, antioxidant systems that specifically uh, block uh, ferroptosis. So this would be GPX4, BH4, ubiquinol, squalene, um, a lot of mo monounsaturated fatty acids, all of these or dietary antioxidants which promote cancer like vitamin E in clinical trials, they all prevent um, this lipid radical from inducing ferroptosis. And so one of the things, again, trying to find um, uh, the specificity in the biology of ROS, we, we've been doing a lot of CRISPR screens and I wanna thank my friend David Sabatini for teaching us how to do this years ago. Colleen Rezek in my lab learned how to do these and uh, we continue to do them. 
And one of the things we thought about is, okay, if we go back to this model and we've been more interested in this localized signal of uh, H2O2 from mitochondria that can impinge on survival, proliferation, or metastasis. <clears throat> and um, uh, we and others had reported that if you give sort of these garden variety mito-targeted antioxidants like mitotempo or mitovitamin E or mitoQ, so these are antioxidants that specifically have a cation uh, TPP moiety, and therefore the antioxidant goes into the mitochondria to uh, uh, scavenge superoxide or peroxide. And, and uh, so one of the screens we did was we just took uh, jerk cat cells, garden variety jerk cat cells. We use a metabolic library that David Sabatini um, developed, and uh, we infect all these cells. It has a pyromycin selection, uh, and so you have uh, basically uh, 3,000 genes, 10 guide RNAs per gene, 30,000 guys, about 35 million cells we do for coverage. And we can either give it untreated, right, or we put 50 nanomolars of mitochondrial targeted vitamin E. Okay, so this is vitamin E that goes in the mitochondria. At 50 nanomolar, it doesn't really kill the cells. So it hurts them a little bit, right, uh, uh, but, but it doesn't kill. And what we're looking, we're putting this uh, selective pressure and asking for what genes now are synthetic lethal, right? It, with a little bit of MBE. So we're looking for genes that are deleterious only in the presence of MBE, and we let them double, and we can subtract what genes, what guides drop out here compared to the untreated. And these were the top hits we got. Many of them um, were part of complex one. And, and so then we started to validate it. And yeah, for example, the top hit end of A6, once, anytime we find uh, a particular hit, we go in with now uh, with single CRISPR clones, uh, multiple clones of uh, this particular, uh, and it validated. That's the beauty of these screens. They always validate. They're very robust, and we're very happy about that. Uh, but I can just show you some pharmacological data as well. As many of you know, pyrocytin is a site-specific inhibitor of complex one. Uh, and you can see um, uh, in the presence of MVE, uh, pyrocytin is now deleterious. But interestingly, not with antamycin. And we could do this with mitotempo, another mitochondrial target antioxidant. And that was the first clue there was something interesting happening. And, and if you look at this screen here, many of the genes were complex one, rarely complex three, right? <clears throat> and so that was quite interesting why there was a specificity of complex one being synthetic lethal with MBE or mitotempo, these mitochondrial target antioxidants, but not with antamycin. And so then one of the things we did is we started to look at what happens to ROS. And this is a, just an isolated mitochondria system where we're looking at superoxide being released. Uh, we dump in SOD uh, in the buffer uh, with Amplex Red to measure uh, peroxide. And you can see that mitotempo uh, uh, decreases, uh, and we give a bunch of substrates to the mitochondria to generate superoxide and H2O2. Uh, so this is looking at H2O2 release and superoxide release from mitochondria. And you can see mitotempo decreases. Pyrocytin maintains that antamycin increases, it, but uh, in the mitotempo plus pyrocytin really decreased uh, the H2O2 release from mitochondria, but not antamycin. And that really suggested to us that the mitotempo plus pyrocytin was decreasing ROS, which was therefore, uh, you know, hurting the cells, while antamycin maintained in the, this. And, uh, and you can uh, uh, further see this. Is, is, uh, so the idea is that complex one generates superoxide, which, is, which would eventually be a leak out. Uh, to H2O2, or complex one can give electrons all the way to complex three. And complex three tends to uh, make electrons in the intermembrane space or mitochondrial matrix. Uh, Martin Brand, uh, who's a pioneer in, uh, in the field of uh, ROS biology, has these site-specific uh, complex three superoxide scavengers. So then we basically said is, and so what would happen? And uh, so one of the things that antamycin tends to do is it tends to maintain the superoxide production uh, from complex three, and therefore, uh, you know, uh, you get this uh, continued increase in ROS. Uh, but what happens if you prevent complex three from making uh, uh, superoxide? And you can see if we give a, a mitotempo with pyrocytin, you get this decrease. But mitotempo plus sequel with pyrocytin or with antamycin uh, and, uh, will also decrease uh, 
uh, cell growth. Uh, again, the simple point here is, is now that with antimyosin plus uh, mitotempo, we, we were able to maintain the ROS signal, and therefore we're able to maintain cell, uh, uh, cell growth and cell proliferation. But now if we prevent complex three from making any superoxide by giving this superoxide scavenger, again, the cells stop proliferating and really suggest that mitochondrial complex three is essential for the cell fitness of these cells. And that's, that, that I think is a, is a, was one of the key findings. Uh, we also did, um, um, just to further uh, make the point and that there was a difference between complex one versus complex three inhibition in the presence of a mitochondrial targeted antioxidant. And so what we noticed is uh, uh, antimyosin plus uh, mitotempo, which is anti plus uh, MT, uh, and compared to pyrocytin plus MT, the pyrocytin plus mitotempo, which was, uh, again, detrimental to the cells, uh, robustly activated the integrated stress response. And you can see a variety of ATFs being, being upregulated with pyrocytin plus mitotempo. Uh, and not with the other conditions. And again, this is just another indication that uh, uh, if you give Pierce, if you inhibit complex one with an antioxidant, you can really decrease ROS levels and activate the integrated stress response. Now, one of the things, um, again, going back to my our model that you got to do everything in vivo eventually, um, we wanted to know what would happen in vivo. And so here, uh, uh, we, we, again, use the notch-driven leukemic models, uh, and either we gave it no drug, we gave it fenformin, which is a, we and others have shown is a complex one inhibitor, mitotempo, the same mitochondrial targeted antioxidant, or the combination, and remember, uh, the, the complex one inhibition plus the mitotempo in, viv in vitro was the most detrimental compared to either one alone. And this is exactly what we saw when we did it uh, in vivo. So in the bone marrow spleen or in the lymph nodes, you can see at the doses we gave a fenformin or metformin, and we didn't really get much decrease based in the leukemic, but the combination severely diminished the leukemic in the bone marrow spleen and in the lymph nodes. And again, just highlighting that mitochondrial uh, dependent ROS signaling is necessary, at least in this uh, sort of leukemic models. And so this is sort of our, uh, this was recently published, and uh, so this is sort of our simple story. Uh, one of the key things we are continuing to do is, you know, trying to figure out what the, the key cysteine residues which are promoting this tumorigenic redox signaling, which is necessary for growth, cell survival, proliferation in vivo. And this is an area we need to continue to work on, especially figuring out what the relevant targets as, uh, in vivo are. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I want to just uh, finish the cancer part before I move on to the new disease part. You know, one of the lessons we are learning as a community in the cancer metabolism field, and I think um, the, the folks who know cancer uh, are well aware of this sort of paradigm. I think that metabolism people uh, naively, and I'm one of them, uh, thought, you know, we were going to get the magic bullet, right? In the sense that very similar to what the uh, angiogenesis people thought 20 years ago, that every tumor needs a blood vessel, therefore anti-angiogenic therapy would be the miracle, right? It would work all the time. Of course, that hasn't panned out. And it was the same with metabolism, right? Um, in vitro, every tumor uses glucose and glutamine, and therefore, if you target glucose or glutamine in cancers, uh, you should have remarkable anti-tumor effects in vivo. And that hasn't really panned out, in part because we uh, figured out that metabolism is very plastic in cancer cells. It's very complicated in vivo. And so uh, my lab, for sure, and many others are, have just gone back to the drawing board and said, you know, let's do it the way everybody else in cancer uh, biology thinks about therapy. First thing you do is you stratify your patients, right? You look at particular driver mutations, such as like KEEP1 in lung cancer. Then you use the standard of care therapy, could be chemo, radio, or immunotherapy. And then figure out which is the best metabolic therapy a, uh, in a particular uh, stratified cancer with a particular standard of care, right? So you already have the standard of care. You already have a particular cancer type based on driver mutations. And, as, and then figure out what is the best uh, metabolic target given those two uh, inputs, the patient stratification and standard of care. And this is what we're doing now with unbiased CRISPR screens in vivo where we're dialing in a particular set of 
subset of cancers and we're dialing in a particular immunotherapy, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and then asking unbiasedly which metabolic genes are necessary uh, only under those conditions of standard of care. Uh, and, uh, and, and hopefully we can find something new. But I think this is sort of the way to go forward, uh, one way to go forward. Okay. So let me, um, in the remaining sort of 15 minutes, tell you an interesting story about how we got into neurological diseases. Uh, something I wasn't thinking about, but it really came out of our cancer work. Uh, and uh, it is, um, you know, uh, beyond cancer, I think anybody who works in mitochondria can't help but not think about mitochondria's role broadly in, uh, in diseases. As you know, if you go to Google right now, and you type in cardiovascular, liver, aging, cancer, any of these neurodegeneration for sure, uh, <clears throat> one prevailing model is always in mitochondrial dysfunction and explains it, right? And, and the key is, is it really cause or consequence, right? Because end-stage pathology, whether it's cardiovascular or neurodegeneration or aging, will show mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, but that, that could just be a consequence of, of, uh, of the pathology. It's just a marker of the pathology. It's not a causal agent, right? It's not the driver of the pathology. And so uh, one of the places probably the best linked for uh, cause of the pathology is neurodegeneration. And in particular, two places. So there's uh, these childhood mitochondrial diseases like Lee syndrome, um, which tend to have neurological symptoms as their main symptoms. So many mitochondrial diseases show neurological symptoms. So there it's clearly causal because the mutation is in the mitochondrial gene. The other uh, place is Parkinson's disease. The best link for any neurodegenerative disease is Parkinson's. Uh, and so almost 40 years ago, it was found that um, one of these party drugs, if you took it, uh, it inhibited mitochondrial complex one. It caused rapid uh, dopaminergic uh, neuronal loss uh, um, uh, with Parkinson's like symptoms. So we know complex one inhibition in humans, uh, uh, down regulation or inhibition in dopaminergic neurons is sufficient to give you uh, 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 Parkinson's disease. Uh, so I think those two are the places definitely it seems to be causal. But the question is, what does mitochondrial dysfunction look like? What does it mean? Uh, and and uh, uh, this is one of the nice reviews. Uh, and you know, it's the canonical explanations. If mitochondrial dysfunction happens for whatever reason, um, maybe your lysosomes don't work, so you have impaired mitophagy, you have reduced ATP production and too much ROS, ROS being bad here. Uh, and perhaps uh, what I'd like to propose is maybe a third way that maybe a metabolite is generated, which is toxic. So you have metabolite toxicity. The slowly, over time, you accumulate a metabolite that is toxic and pathogenic. And uh, the metabolite that we think about is L2-hydroxyglutarate. Right? Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, the way we noticed that L2-AG is elevated is we took cancer cells with complex three mutations. And, and when you do unbiased metabolomics, the top hit was L2-AG. And every time we did that, we found that L2AG with complex three loss was one of the top metabolites. So that got us thinking. So a little bit about 2AG. I don't have to explain to this audience uh, who thought about IDH mutations, uh, that IDH mutations generate the D form of 2H, which is linked to AML, for example. So you have mutations in IDH one or two that'll take alpha ketoglutarate and make D2AG. Now, um, the one that I'm interested in is the L form, right? It's, sig it's sibling, and the chiral D and L. Oh, and the L is made by normal enzymes like MDH1 or 2 or LDH only in the presence of NADH levels are high. That is the real key. And there's an enzyme called L2-HGDH, I'll talk about it, that can convert L2-HG back to alpha ketoglutarate, right? And this is really um, the key point and is that these are made by normal enzymes, not mutations like in, found in uh, IDH. Everybody can make this as uh, L2AG. Plants make it, E. coli make it, Drosophila make it, everybody makes it. Um, only when NADH levels are high. When are NADH levels high? As you know, that complex one takes NADH and regenerates NAD. So if you have complex one inhibition or anything downstream of any of these are inhibited, three, four, cytochrome C, ATP synthase, you will have a buildup of NADH, H, and therefore it will trigger L2AG. So for example, uh, if we take complex three knockout hematopoietic stem cells, there's a buildup of NADH, uh, 
and it's so NAD and ADH goes down. So these are the same hematopoietic stem cells that I talked about earlier with the loss of complex three, where the mice <clears throat> become anemic because the stem cells are there, but they don't make uh, progenitors. And again, when we took those stem cells out and we put them through mass spec, we noticed that there was a lot of 2-hydroxyglutarate. Okay, so, right? so the absence of complex three, the uh, loss of complex three, the uh, 2-HG accumulated to almost millimolar levels. Of, uh, and that was uh, very gratifying. And we've seen this over and over. All right, and so the simple idea is when NADH builds up due to mitochondrial dysfunction, um, maladehydrogenase 2, uh, so remember, maladehydrogenase 2, as its name, likes to take malad and NAD typically, uh, but if NADH is there, it'll take alpha-ketoglutarate and slowly make L2-AG. There's an enzyme called L2-AGDH, uh, this dehydrogenase, which will convert it back to alpha-ketoglutarate. Okay. This can happen... Uh, here, NDH1 and LDH. Uh, acidic pH will make this reaction go. This will equilibrate across us, uh, the membranes. And so we're excited because L2AG is elevated when NADH NAD erasure goes up. When NADH goes up, which is due to mitochondrial dysfunction. So that part is great. It, here's the second part that I think is great about it. it you know, this. 3,000 metabolites. People always ask me, how do you pick, like, you know, it's like RNA seq when genes go up and down. How do you pick a metabolite that's of interest? Well, L2AG is super interesting because there's more than 75 enzymes that can inhibit it. So, this is the alpha ketoglutarate dioxygenase family, and L2AG is one of the most potent inhibitors of this family. So, what are these families? So, here's the Egolin 9, the prolyl hydroxylases, uh, which in part the Nobel Prize for oxygen sensing in HIF was given because uh, uh, these are the negative regulators of the, of the HIF response. And so 2-AG can inhibit eglin 9 and uh, increase uh, HIF levels. Here are the TET, part of the DNA demethylases. Here are the ALF-B1, which is part of DNA damage responses. Here are the Jumanji domain and the histone demethylases. The FTO, which is part of RNA demethylases. Right? This is why I'm so excited about 2-AG being linked to mitochondria, because A, 2-AG goes up during mitochondrial dysfunction, and it can inhibit all these enzymes. And, and we've seen, in like in our stem cells and in other systems, when 2-AG levels go up due to mitochondrial dysfunction, that the DNA gets hypermethylated and the histones get hypermethylated, right? So clearly 2-AG can and, uh, invoke a lot of uh, very cool biology, especially around histones and DNA methylation. Here's the third part, and this was sort of the aha moment for us, uh, which is very simple. We just asked, where is 2-AG uh, uh, linked in human uh, genetics, right? What, uh, what does it have to do with in humans? And it turns out there are people who uh, unfortunately have a mutation in the scavenger enzyme, right? So they don't have any mitochondrial dysfunction, and, but they have a loss in 2-AGDH. And because of that, they slowly built up 2-AG, which can be measured in the urine, the plasma, uh, the CSF. Uh, what's amazing about this is that... Um, these patients don't have uh, any mutations in mitochondria, yet they still will build up 2-AG. It really implies that all of us are building up 2-AG, even right now, maybe during sleep, uh, because hypoxia can activate 2-AG. And we need this enzyme to always get rid of 2-AG in our brains. And uh, because if you lose that, then slowly you build up 2-AG. The people are born, but they have ataxia, they have epilepsy. Yeah. So all this says is that 2-AG is sufficient to cause neuropathology in humans, right? And that's led us to a broad hypothesis is that in neurological diseases where you have mitochondrial dysfunction, can you have an increase in 2-AG as the causal agent? So I presented this hypothesis to Joe Bateman a few years ago uh, at King's College, and the Joe told me that he had just published a nice paper in Drosophila <clears throat> where they put a gene called TFAM uh, overexpressed in neurons. TFAM controls mitochondrial DNA. So if you have too much TFAM, in the brains of these Drosophila, you get a climbing defect, right? You get proteotoxicity in the mitochondria. So this is a mitochondrial stress-driven neuronal dysfunction. Great. I said, give me the brains. We'll measure metabolomics. 2-AG goes up. And uh, Joe quickly made uh, flies where you can overexpress the dehydrogenase to decrease 2-AG in the brain in these TFAM uh, overexpressing uh, Drosophila. And the TFAM overexpressing Drosophila have a climbing defect, right? And exactly what he reported in his paper. But this was a, a, a great experiment that Joe did. 
He overexpressed the dehydrogenase, which we could show by mass spec works because it decreases 2AG levels, and, the, and these flies now sort of start to climb and fly again, right? And in, in this one model, I don't want to overinterpret it, it is clear uh, that L2AG is a, uh, is a, is a neuronal specific uh, TFAM model with the climbing defect due to mitochondrial dysfunction, L2AG is a culprit. And we have a similar experiment in mice going, right? It, and, uh, and one of the places where we're thinking about doing this is in Parkinson's and mitochondrial diseases to see if L2AG is uh, driving the pathology, and, and hopefully we'll have an answer to this soon. Let me just show you our efforts in the mitochondrial disease model. It's a disease model driven by complex one. As you know, complex one has 45 subunits. One of the subunits is called the NDOS4, uh, which has been mutated in a, in, a, in a syndrome called Lee syndrome. And there's a beautiful old model where you can knock out NDOS4 globally or just in the CNS by nesting Cree, and it recapitulates the Lee syndrome all of these things, and the mice die at day 40, right? They get a toxic, they get epilepsy. It's one of the better mouse models of any given disease. Richard Palmiter uh, and Dr. Quintana developed this, and it's a beautiful uh, model to study Lee syndrome, this devastating childhood disease. It's, and so uh, we're trying to manipulate L2AG in this system, but the other thing we thought about manipulating is just complex one on uh, biology. So <clears throat> just to remind you, complex one regenerates NAD, and also uh, pumps protons. By pumping protons, it's linked to ATP generation. And what we said, well, if you lose NDOS4, you lose complex one activity by about 70%. What happens if we put the yeast single protein NDI1? So remember, this is 45 subunits. You lose the NDOS4, the complex starts to fall apart. You get a hypomorph where you, know, you don't have much activity of complex one. Now we put in one subunit of uh, yeast, NDI1, and you get a regeneration of NAD to NAD, right? It doesn't proton pump. Um, Colleen Rezek made this NDI1 with stop codons in front of it, and so we can conditionally overexpress NDI1 wherever we, we want. Wherever the CRE is, we, it gets rid of the stop codon, NDI1 comes. Greg McElroy took a NDOS4 flux and this conditional NDI1 and crossed them together with nest and CRE, the, and again, NDOS4 gets rid of complex one. If NDI1 is there, you'll get the electron um, flux through the system without the proton pumping. And you can see the NDI1 works great. We can take some cerebral neurons. We can give it pure cytin. Oxygen consumption rates go down. Uh, if there's NDI1, you can maintain oxygen consumption rates. This is just a positive control. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and this just suggests that the NDI1 is working the way we think it's working. And this was spectacular finding for us, at least. I mean, think about it. We're asking a single protein in yeast to complement the loss of a 45 subunit mitochondrial complex. One, 70% of these mice go on to live. Uh, and I think uh, this is a, is a really interesting tool to probe the biology of complex one in different systems. And we're obviously doing that. Um, and just to show you, uh, in vivo, the NDI1 works the way we think it does, is we took cerebellum, um, uh, the, the cerebellum um, chunks of the brain, and, and uh, compared to the NDOS4 flux, you can see 2AGs increased. And by rescuing the NAD regeneration by NDI1, 2AG goes down. And you can see all these things that are uh, upregulated are brought back largely in the presence of NDI1. And, and I think um, this is a, a nice model to sort of probe the biology of complex one, NAD regeneration from ATP production. And really uh, sort of uh, the big take home message for us is uh, one of the things that these sort of uh, uh, ancient metabolic enzymes from yeast and others from bacteria, we can actually make mice with them and now go in vivo and sort of dissect uh, what complex one or three or two are really doing because remember like complex one or, or three it proton pumps uh, for ATP generation but it also does electron transport uh, to keep NAD or FADH regeneration to keep the TCA cycle and things like NDI1 can do one function but not the other and there's many other uh, ancient metabolic enzymes that one can put in and I think this is going to be uh, uh, an important uh, set of tools to probe uh, um, whether it's in the brain or in other systems. And finally, um, 
the 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 larger sort of uh, big picture thought is, you know, if you think about any common diseases, heart failure, diabetes, uh, cancer, obviously neurological diseases, we you know we've grown accustomed to thinking of diseases driven by I would say largely by two big major pathways: DNA damage, whether it's mitochondrial DNA damage or nuclear DNA damage. Uh, or proteotoxicity, you know, the proteins have misfolded or you have aggregation. Uh, but I would argue that the best evidence that metabolism uh, being dysregulated can cause diseases comes from inborn errors of metabolism, right? We know if you perturb metabolism, you can get all sorts of diseases, right? I mean, uh, this is a whole field of inborn errors of metabolism. The real question is whether common diseases have an underlying dysregulation of metabolism. And uh, downstream of DNA damage or proteotoxicity, but whether it's the metabolite toxicity that is causal for these common diseases. And this is an idea that we want to really test. Finally, uh, a cheap plug. Uh, as uh, metabolism came back, uh, many people, including my own students, don't like reading the great Leninger books and Stryer books. Uh, so, you know, I wrote a book five years ago, uh, which is not to replace the mitochondria. Uh, the great biochemistry books. These are just books to uh, a simple book um, that integrates uh, metabolism to the rest of biology. The best part of the book is P. Jeff's um, um, uh, illustrations. It's been translated in Japanese, which is great. Uh, I hope someone will translate it in Chinese. That way that the market will be bigger and I can buy a nice uh, bottle of Bordeaux. Uh, anyways, <laughs> thank you for the kind invitation. No